It's no secret that Fallout 76 is a controversial title. You could go to any social media website, you're bound to see a lot of takes that paint the game in a poor light. Of course, there has been a number of updates since launch and has transformed the entry in a significant way. So, after playing well over 100 hours, let's talk about Fallout 76. So let's break down the video, and as usual, I'll have chapters if you want to skip to another section. The subject will be broken between history, gameplay, bugs and glitches, community, story, world and aesthetics, and wrap up. The last bit, giving my own personal opinions overall. Let's begin. Fallout 76 came about from Bethesda's desire to make a Fallout 4 multiplayer mode, revealed by Todd Howard himself in a no-clip documentary on 76. Between technical and logistical challenges, and the developers wanting to be experimental, the game launched without human NPCs, which received a lot of criticism. Of course, Bethesda's choice of not having said NPCs wasn't the only criticism. There were issues with merchandising, technical problems with the support ticket system leaking private player information, and criticisms regarding a subscription model, which has gated long requested features. Still, after the game received numerous updates, including major ones such as Wastelanders, Fallout 76 now sits in a higher regard than it did years ago. The gameplay of 76, being built off the core of Fallout 4, unsurprisingly, plays extremely similar to it. Even the character creation system is very familiar, which I use to create my exceptionally handsome gentleman. Gunplay is largely the same, as is modding your armor and weapons, and there's still a very strong emphasis on junk collection. There are plenty of noticeable differences, of course. Some of these are from the multiplayer aspect, while some are simply design choices. For instance, while special and perks still replace the use of skills, as Fallout 4 did, the perk system is a bit overhauled. Instead of gaining another point in special by selecting said special as a perk, you upgrade one special stat by getting a corresponding perk card that relates to said stat. You don't actually have to choose that perk to use in your build either. You could take a different perk card entirely. So every time you level up until the soft cap and you can lay down as many cards, or at least the value of the cards, as you have in that specific special. As an example, if you have 10 of strength, you could have 3 ranks of heavy gunner, 3 ranks of expert heavy gunner, 3 ranks of master heavy gunner, and then a single rank of strong back. Every level up you get allows you to choose a special point until level 50, which prompts the soft cap. No more special points unless you take a legendary perk card, but discussing the legendary perk system is a bit above what I want to talk about. No more advances in your deriving stats, leveling up from this point on allows you to choose new perk cards only, though you're still limited to the special count. You can freely swap cards in and out. Carrying too much of that sweet, sweet loot, you can swap out damaging perks in favor of things that reduce the weight of the items that you're carrying. And your build doesn't have to be limited to the special you originally chose. Using the punch card machine, an item you can find in a few spots and build out your own camp, you can swap out builds, whole new special, and thus different perk cards. So you can have different builds with different focuses, perhaps one for crafting while you use another to deal damage. It's convenient, absolutely, but it really can make builds feel arbitrary when you can retool them so easily. Speaking of retooling, the Fallout 4 sediment building system was retooled for Fallout 76's camp system. The way it functions, what items you can put down, and many of the ingredients needed to create said items are similar if not identical. There are some obvious differences too, needless to say, but one of them is the difference between a tent. While sediment building is about, well, building settlements, the camp system is about building your camp, or base, rather. That being said, you're much more restricted in the amount of area you can build your camp, while the sediment system gives you a lot more room. Though, you can build your camp nearly anywhere in 76, and are not confined to a set number of locations, as is the way it works in an unmodded Fallout 4 game. Of course, I imagine that the limited build area is compromised for the multiplayer aspect of 76, and you don't really need too terribly much room to make some rather good looking bases. While I'm rather bland myself and just have a square and some crafting areas, you can find some really well designed bases out there. On the subject of camp, one of the more annoying aspects of the system is the rather limiting storage that you have. 1200 pounds sounds like a lot, but play enough of the game and it quickly becomes a chore to constantly manage. This storage is universal, so no matter how many stash packets or container you built your camp, the amount is not going to change a bane to any hoarder, which is definitely a habit many players of the Fallout franchise have picked up. 
still, this used to be a lot more restrictive in the past. 400, 600, 800, and now the 1200. So maybe I shouldn't complain too much. Regardless, it does force you to go through your items, deciding what to keep and what to ditch, which could be a good or bad thing depending on your preferences. Armors of guns that you don't use can be sold to vendors, but all vendors share a universal pool of caps, which is frustrating. Sadly, you cannot sell ammo, while junk is often valuable. In ammo and junk, can be some stealthy problems due to stacking. You can sell ammo to other players, and some of that ammo you get are in higher demand, such as 5mm. If you happen to have a focus on a specific gun type, that could be a good way to make some caps and lighten your stash weight, if you happen to feel that just dropping the ammo is a waste. I should mention the trade ammo machine, but that thing is tedious to use, though it's still an option if you have some ammo that you just can't seem to sell, so it's not a complete waste. As said, junk is valuable, so you may not want to sell it. However, some junk is plentiful and you probably feel no issue with selling it. But bar ditching some unneeded junk, the only other option is the scrap box, which is gated behind the Fallout First subscription model. From what I read, it has no storage limit. This is one of the more controversial aspects of the subscription model, but also one of the biggest drivers for why someone might choose to pay for it. Personally, I cannot justify paying for a subscription service, for this or any other perk that Fallout First offers. But I know some others do feel it's a worthy expense. But for me, it isn't. And I would rather manage my own storage than pay for what many feels like a monetized solution to an arbitrary problem. However, my own feelings on the matter do not invalidate the choices other consumers make when dealing with their own finances. Other than that, the game plays quite similarly to Fallout 4, especially in the area of combat. Though even then, there are some noticeable differences. Namely in regards to VATS, which simply targets the mob you're fighting. A specific body part if you have the right perk. It's not a default option. It doesn't slow down time, though you wouldn't really expect it to, given this game is an online multiplayer. Speaking of combat and it being online, I've noticed latency in regards to damage being calculated many times. I can enter your creature's HP and notice a very, very short delay until they actually die. For me, in my area of the US, I don't think it's hindered my progress, but it's certainly noticeable. I can't speak for how long the delay might be for others, especially those outside the US. A final note on combat would be this game's level scaling system. It not only exists, but is very plainly obvious. I would talked about my distaste for level scaling before, but I'm also a bit more understanding in an online game, as balance between players is a definite concern. That said, I'm not a fan of the way it's handled in 76. It's very loud about scaling, as enemies will often be your same level, almost always except for some locations, floor or ceiling. It turns enemies into bullet sponges and completing what's intended to be an early game mission becomes a chore. It's very annoying. That said, I know there are fans of it in the 76 community, quoting the challenge aspect that the scaling system brings. For me, it's tiring and exhausting and often leaves me irritated than actually having fun. Again, I get level scaling is a thing for a reason, especially in regards to multiplayer, but I'm not a fan of scaling enemies up. I'd rather go the Guild Wars 2 method of scaling the player down, if in a lower level region, with transparency about the levels of that region. That way, a stronger player with good gear can keep their good gear and be at the high end of the region's scale and still handle most enemies with relative ease, while also keeping some challenge for them. As of now, I'm not sure what the ceilings or floors are for an area, I found this map, but it's from 2018, and I know it has inaccuracies after various updates, as I have fought rather high-leveled enemies in the starting areas. Moving away from combat, let's talk about how the added human NPCs work. After all, in the original vision for the game world, players were meant to, more or less, take on the role of the NPCs. The new dialogue system introduced to these particular NPCs take the form of something much more akin to the older Fallouts rather than Fallout 4. It's actually most similar to Fallout New Vegas, with binary checks. Well, it won't even allow you to select a dialogue if you don't have the required stat for it. The checks I've seen were all special based, such as having an 8 in perception. Passing these checks can result in some positive outcomes, such as getting loot or skipping parts of a quest. While it's not as involved as older dialogue checks, it's quite nice to see a return in some form. Also, the more important human NPCs are immortal, unless a quest allows you to kill them. This can be a negative for some player, but I get why it's like that, online game and all. Speaking of which, there's online specific features such as grouping together that can often give benefits, public events that can be spawned by completing specific objectives, or seasonal content such as holiday focus aesthetics or double XP weekends. Though there still isn't any support for communicating via text only, 
which is important for some people. That being said, even with content that focuses on multiplayer activities, 76 can be played almost entirely by yourself. Almost. There are a couple of quests that require other players, but none of them are too terribly story important. Still, it's surprising how much is soluble given the online nature of the title. What's not surprising is just how grindy the game is, as with most online titles, grinding levels, resources, and gear. And with how much of the game is RNG, it can get pretty tiring. Want the right combinations of mutations but don't want to pay too much for it? Get heavily irradiated and hope you get a mutation. And hope that mutation is a good one. If not, get rid of it and server hop, repeat. Or spend a long time bouncing to the power armor spawning locations in Watoga or nearby areas, serving hopping until you find what you want. Very mind numbing. Something else that is mind numbing is our next section. Bethesda games are no stranger to bugs, of course, and yes, while it is still very playable on patch, one of the advantages of playing a single player title is the ability to download an unofficial patch mod. Something even supported on consoles these days. And you can't do that with 76, it's largely up to the devs to roll out patches. And to be fair, they do. But even still, I ran into some frustrating bugs, such as completed quest objectives not registering. Here's an example. In Strange Bedfellows, you have to go to Top of the World and clear out the Scorch on the second floor to set up a meeting with the leader of the Crater Raiders, Meg. Except when I clear out the Scorch, nothing. Okay, I've had a situation beforehand in a different quest where I had to server hop and it fixed a similar issue. I do that, clear out the Scorch again, and nothing. We'll shut down, restart, repeat, nothing. I try several different times, over and over again. Once even staying off the ground and making sure to kill suicider scorches because I thought maybe them blowing themselves up was not triggering their kill count. Or something. Eventually, after several server hops running around on low ammo for my Gatling gun, I just killed them with a shotgun and apparently that worked? I don't know if the Gatling gun just doesn't work or some servers just work better than others, but this time it worked. Which is weird because the world was visually breaking down. Oh yeah, a smaller glitch thing, apparently as you server hop enough, the graphics start to go a little crazy in some spots, given this cliche glitchy effect. I don't know exactly why, but I'm sure there's a technical reason. Another bug that I've been reliably able to replicate in West Tech is one that comes from me just trying to farm some super mutants. Clearing out the ones from the upstairs and taking the elevator down and clearing out the downstairs super mutants and coming back causes super mutants upstairs to respawn, but naked and broken. Like they'll just stand there and do nothing. But they attack you with their soul or something. It's like their hitbox leaves the model and attacks you without a weapon. Except you can't shoot the invisible hitbox attacking you. You have to shoot the actual mutant model. I guess they had two different hitboxes. One for attacking, one for registering damage. You can evade the attacking ghost and everything. And it stops when the mutant dies. And when you look at the super mutant's inventory, the items suddenly spawn. Also, the world is again sort of falling apart. Some prop pieces will pop in and out of existence. Objects like doors can't be activated, but you can fast travel. But fast traveling a second time often causes the game to freeze up on a load screen. This actually isn't the only instances I come across this bug. At Camp Atlas, I came back from completing a quest downstairs and everyone was, once again, naked. At least this time, nobody was hostile and trying to attack me with their minds. So I was down to party. Another quest bug actually comes from the Raider group where I was having to save Rara, a human child, for Gail, a super mutant. Depending how you treat her, she will either be happy you treated her well or upset that you treated her poorly. Simple enough. Throughout the mission, she was talking about how good of a friend I was. Swell. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you! You're almost as nice as Gail. Only if I have to. You weren't very nice to me. What? Bye, buttface. What? Rara says you are bad. What? For what it's worth, it doesn't really matter. By the end of the main quest line, she acted like we were cool and everything. But still. What? The last bug that really sticks out to me is some simple UI stuff. Writing for some T51B, having to deal with the RNG, I kept getting thrown back to the same servers that I have already left. I looked up some solutions for how to get on a new server. One of the solutions I found was blocking a player for a session, which would keep you from getting to that same server until you close the game. Sounds simple. Except it wasn't. Right clicking on a random player, the menu will sometimes trip out and try to force itself back to the top option. I've accidentally added players to party or worse to my friends list, causing me to embarrassingly leave or remove them from my friends list. And it's weird because sometimes it'll work just fine. Sometimes it'll work fine for a few seconds then trip out and sometimes it's tweaked from the start. 
There are a few other things too, occasional broken animations, rubber banding due to latency. One time, I came across an immortal Mr. Handy. It wasn't able to attack me, but dropping his health, even to zero, just caused it to refill. But at least these are some fairly harmless bugs. Being an online game, you have to mention the community. It's actually rather welcoming. Not too many people go out of the way to mess with other players. It's surprising for an online title too. There's trolls, of course, grievers, but they sound like they're honestly very rare. Pull up RFO76, and you're likely to read someone gratefully talking about somebody who did something cool for them. That or read about people complaining about lack of content, talking about how there's no updates. Which, as someone who plays a lot of Team Fortress 2, a game that hasn't got a major update since 2017, I kind of find that funny. That all being said, the community is pretty well behaved. I have the assumption that a lot of the developers completely intended for the Blair Blades to be murdering each other all the time, but no, they're actually pretty relaxed. If nothing else, most of the 76 player just let you do your own thing. Nobody ever really bothered me, but at least one guy was absolutely captured by my elegant good looks. I should mention that some new players are worried about setting off their first nuke. Unsure if people will actually show up for the Scorched Beast Queen. Just, before anything else, be sure to check to make sure there's a few high level players on the server, then go to the silo, because nuke it and they will come. The nuke gives a loud warning to everyone on the server, so people are likely to show up. Also be sure to blast off the nuke about here. This is the meta for now, and it's fairly appreciated by the player base, so they don't have to fight the queen in radiation. So what about the narrative of 76? Well, that depends. There's some side questing material, individual stories, as well as four main quest stories divided between the updates. I'm going to focus on the main quest stories, however. Let's start with the base game. As already stated a few times, originally the game had a lack of NPCs, and it was actually an integral part of the original game's main story quest. There's a lot of deceased factions that take you on this journey to see and explore the history of said factions and learn how they were combating the Scorch Plague. The Vault 76 Overseer leads you to the responders who point you to the Fire Breathers, which is a subgroup of the responders, who directs you to the top of the world, and Rose, who is a remnant bot of the Raiders, who guides you to the Free States, who leads you to the Brotherhood, who directs you to the Enclave. And the Enclave is a group that has the needed material to get access to the nuke silos to spawn the Sports Beast Queen. Our shining personality. Honestly though, it's not just some long tour of seeing dead people and nuking a big bat. The overall theme of the base game's main storyline is about how each faction was doing research and finding ways to combat the Scorched, and they all had their own tools to survive. But because they had self-interest, they were never working together, and were all overran by the Scorched. Really, the Overseer says as much so in one of her holotapes. All these divergent groups, responders, Brotherhood of Steel, whatever, Separately, they had everything necessary to beat the odds. Brains, brawn, and bravado to spare. And what did they do? Close ranks. Get paranoid. Refuse to work with one another. The moral of the story is just about the superpower of teamwork. From the responders able to teach survival skills and researching a cure for the Scorch virus, to the Enclave having the tools to summon and kill the biggest carrier of the Scorch Plague, the Scorch Beast Queen. The last part is actually very important. It's an overall interesting narrative that really puts the player on a specific path, each quest pointing you to the next so you can explore the wasteland in a guided way. It's nothing special though, especially when you're able to just wander around and stumble upon main quest material before the attended path. But still, it's interesting enough. Nothing memorable, but nothing terrible. The Wastelander update builds out the main quest of the base game. More specifically, how the player needs to have the inoculation against the Sports Plague to continue after meeting the Overseer in person. The Overseer wants the player to take their blood and have the antibodies replicated and manufacture a vaccine at a Nuka-Cola factory, so it can be given to the nearby settlement of Foundation and Crater, the latter being the Raider group. The manufacturing Nuka-Cola vaccine actually has one of my favorite jokes in the game. You could call it, Nuka-Cola, my blood's in it. After that, the Overseer and protagonist learn that Vault 79 is the current location of the United States Gold Reserves and they want to do a heist. Or at least, she wants a player to do a heist, using one of the two groups, the Raiders or the Settlers. It's honestly the player's choice. Do a few quests for one group, or maybe both, up to the point that the player gets to decide who to take on the heist. Personally, I chose Raiders. While I appreciate how much building the Settler has done, like legit, they put work in making Foundation look pretty good, the Raiders just have the more interesting cast of characters. 
The vault gets raided, you meet the residents of the vault, secret service agents who want to rebuild the economy with the gold they have, which may honestly be possible in the future. There's a fair amount of gold there, and it seems that many people around do still have an interest in gold. The story kind of sets up the rebuilding aspect of the game by having two factions being self-sufficient, and set up the possibility in having a possible new economy. Probably has a theme of hope. Then there's still Donis and Still Reigns. I'm going to talk about them together because they're honestly directly connected to each other. Alright, so this story features a small number of California Brotherhood soldiers making their way to the Appalachia Wasteland to try to figure out what happened to the original branch of the Brotherhood in this region and re-establish radio connection back to High Elder Roger Maxson. It's not many soldiers either, only about three actual California Brotherhood soldiers are featured in the game, though there were two more originally, one that died and one that went back to California. The rest of the chapters are local recruits. You get the recruiting broadcasts on your radio, beat Night Shin, Paladin Romani, and Scry Valdez. You do a few missions for them, recover some Brotherhood weapons that got out into the waste, and eventually the Brotherhood has a chance to get back in contact with Maxim. The player, along with Romani and Shin, makes their way to a transmitter that could be used. But Romani tells you that if contact is made, she will want her and himself to stand trial against the Elders. The Brotherhood gave weapons to a town that was being attacked by raiders well before they made their way to the Appalachia Wasteland and the town was wiped out regardless. She claims that the elders will punish Romani and Shin, and that the Appalachian Brotherhood won't be able to help the region. She enjoys the transmitter declaring that this is a new age for the West Virginia chapter. And honestly, that moment itself was kinda cool. The two bicker, then they get a communication that Fort Atlas is being attacked by super mutants. After taking out the mutants, there's a new quest line about trying to find the source of the mutants. Shin jumps on a mine to save an initiate, another pretty cool moment. Romani and the player goes on a half-hearted undercover quest where they learn that a doctor, Dr. Blackburn, has been abducting Wastelanders for his FEV experiments. Dr. Blackburn is actually a pretty decent character, a well-attentioned extremist villain who appears to have some of the master channeling his way, which is cool, to improve and help humanity rather than make supermutants a tool of war. Eventually, the player tracks Dr. Blackburn down with Valdez, who doesn't try to fight back because he feels like he can't do much anyways, and he's already completed his research. There's that too. It is no longer here. I have associates. They are even now finalizing the mechanisms of its distribution. You are too late. He reveals where his modified FEV was going to be released, West Tech, go figure, and turns himself into a supermune, accidentally, to prove himself right. Not only does he turn into one, he turns into what's basically a behemoth. You kill him, and he has to decide what to do with the scientists who were assisting him. Kill them for Shin, or spare them for Romani. Choosing either of these options will result in you killing or making the opposing choice leave. In other words, the Appalachia Brotherhood falls completely under Shin or Romani, and the player becomes a knight errant, which is more or less a title that says you're a knight that's free to leave. And that's the storyline for the still updates. One of the biggest issues I have is kind of a meta thing. While none of this technically clashes with the official canon, what it does do is devalue the importance of the original Fallout and Fallout 3 narrative at the same time. Fallout 1 featured the original introduction of Supermutants and the Brotherhood, and having this game take place before Fallout 1, yet have some similar themes branch over, makes the original feel a lot less important. Mind you, the Supermutant being everywhere ship sailed a long time ago with Fallout 3, so maybe I shouldn't be too surprised or concerned, but still. And if I'm being honest, the Brotherhood's opposition to the Supermutants in Fallout 1 is an extremely mild aspect of the game, since the best they'll do for the Vault Dweller is send a strike force to the front door. As for Fallout 3's narrative importance, West Virginia and Virginia, which has DC, are really close to each other. Like from Huntersville to DC, it's about a 74 hour trip on foot, if the traveler were walking non-stop of course. Being that close kinda seems like there wasn't much of a point for lines traveling to DC. But I do have a hunch that the Appalachian Brotherhood is going to fall under Shin or Romani, so maybe that bit is going to be protected. I already know the super mutants in the region are going to die off pretty fast, given the FEV at the local West Tech is inert. Regardless of narrative's significance, the real story about the update is actually the division of the Brotherhood ideology, suggesting that there's always been this difference between hardliners and sacrificial compassion. It's not about the super mutants, it's about Shin and Romani, representing the two camps. It's a microcosm of the things we later see in Lion's Brotherhood and the Outcasts. And honestly, I can appreciate that aspect of the update, even if I personally wanted to kick Romani and Shin both out and have Valdez take charge. Yeah, the other big issue I have is that it kind of pushes the player to side with Romani over Shin. Shin is pretty unlikable. He's a no-nonsense guy who's rude to you from the start, while Romani is very gracious for your help. 
It makes siding with Shin, like choosing the guy who's been talking down to you since you walked through the door. He's a jerk. He has a point sometimes, but it doesn't change the fact that he's been a jerk to the players since the player showed up. Not a surprise that so many would choose her over him. Especially when the final choice is, hey, you want to execute all these unarmed people begging for their lives? Alright, finally let's move on. I want to talk about some characters who stick out to me first. Because there are actually some pretty interesting ones. My two favorite characters are both members of the Raider group. Weasel and Lucky Lou. Lucky Lou is a ghoul who is lucky because anytime it seems like he's about to be killed, he somehow avoids it, including trying to kill himself. And he's been trying pretty hard, but he can't bring himself to just shoot himself. So he designs these elaborate death traps that always fell on him. And the biggest reason he even wants to die is because he's worried about going feral. As for Weasel, she's introduced in the same quest as Lou, and she can't speak. Having ratted her original gang out, she had her voice box burned out. She uses this old voice modulator. It works well enough, but there's an incomplete word list, and it has no profanity. There are no bad words. I have been trying to say bad words this whole time, but they do not come out. If I try, I can say them in other ways. Poop. Fornicate. Underground Which is highly amusing. Honestly, the entire Raider group at least has somewhat interesting characters in it, while none of the settlers and foundation really sticks out, except for maybe Jin, because her mother was, or well, still is, because of gullification, a Chinese spy. And that's pretty cool. And I guess Penelope Hornwright is kinda interesting. She has a cat and reprograms a liberator, so that's neat. Dr. Blackburn is actually my favorite antagonist that Bethesda has ever wrote, for a Fallout game even if he was pretty short-lived. Maybe it's because I'm a sucker for the well-attention extremists and mad scientist characters, but honestly, I really did enjoy learning about him and listening to his holotapes. He carries himself very well, but part of that might be because the voice actor is so good. Same voice as Joshua Graham from Honest Hearts. Keith, uh, Zarbakai? I have no idea. Actually, the voice work across 76 is really good. It has a number of well-established voice actors, some with pretty recognizable voices. I mean, it's probably not a surprise, there was some great voice work in Fallout 4 as well. But this game really kicked it up a notch. And, while the radio music did get tiresome, it did introduce me to some new tracks that I really enjoyed. I'll even go on to say I enjoyed the cover of Ring of Fire. Which may be a pretty unpopular take, because it's not Johnny Cash. But honestly, it gave such a different feeling compared to the rest of the songs in the game. I just found myself wanting more of that music, and maybe playing on Rosa Station. As for the background music, I wasn't really that taken in by the tracks, personally. There was one that played a Sugar Grove that I really enjoyed, and 3 minute sounds are pretty good to me. But other than that, just rather forgettable. I know others will disagree, but personally, just not that into it. Not bad, just forgettable. As for the world itself, it's actually pretty entertaining. From Ash Heap, a hostile environment that was dedicated to the mining operations, to Watoga, a city ruled by automation. Particularly after Wastelanders. Though I do find it jarring that Wastelanders is set a year after the base game, but we still find base game courses that haven't rotted in a year. I would like the ability to toggle Wastelanders content off so I could explore the dead world that we were originally playing on, since Wastelanders is a sequel. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy the new content quite a lot, and overall I personally feel that the game is better with the new content, but I'd like the ability to just play the base game when doing the base game main quest. Because right now, it's a weird juxtaposition, though I imagine that's a pretty hard request to pull off cleanly would probably have to have dedicated servers for such content differences. So I get why that's unlikely to happen. But if there's one thing I absolutely love from 76, it's the variety of monsters. Many pull from urban legends and those developed from the mine. Grafted monster, honey beast, rad toast, they're all great. Heck, they even brought back floaters. For those less familiar with the classics, floaters have existed in the original two games. Admittedly, they're quite different in 76, but hey, my classic loving side is just happy to see them again. Which is actually quite the theme for me with 76. There's a lot in the way of aesthetics that feels classic inspired. From the design of the Pit Boy, both classic and 76's Pit Boys are the Pit Boy 2000s, to West Tech Vats looking so much like the dipping scene in the Bad End for Fallout 1, to finally the game giving us the Plasma Caster, a weapon that was 1, 2, as well as New Vegas. Though, yes, I do admit that it does look somewhat different. Really, putting on T-51 and taking out Super Mutants of Floaters with a Plasma Caster just puts me in a happy place. But the absorption of classic material is just an example of what I feel Fallout 76 is. A bit of a stew of Fallout elements from other games. Fallout 76 is a weird mashup of various elements from the franchise. Built off 4's variant of the creation engine, 
featuring classic bass elements with things like the Pit Boy 2000 and the Plasma Caster, going into the subject of Brotherhood Ideals, which is a feature of Fallout 3, along with New Vegas-esque style of dialogue checks. It has a little bit of everything while trying to do its own thing. I feel like the team that created 76 do really care a ton about the world of Fallout. At some points, it shines, but I do also feel like the online aspect of the game does get in the way a bit. Server-side bugs, design choices that can make quests feel more like a chore than fun, and content that can't dive too terribly deep because of the need of stagnation for other players. Honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing the 76 team take a swing at a single-player title. I wonder how they would do without the same challenges that multiplayer brings. But this is a topic about 76 itself, not the dev team. Now, would I recommend 76? Personally, I did have fun with the title. There are some aspects that certainly frustrate me, but I only paid 30 bucks for it back some years ago. But on a sale for 10 or 15, there's no doubt there's a lot of content to play through. I power played for a few weeks. If you take your time, you could be on it for a few months. And yeah, definitely get your money's worth. It's probably the most single player online multiplayer focused game out there. If you have time, don't mind some bugs, my latency issues, and grinding, then yeah, you can explore the world, enjoy new quests, and come across interesting aspects of the game and the franchise as a whole. It can be fun at times, and even shines through with some pretty good ideas. As with any game, it has its ups and downs. If you can find it on sale and haven't already made up your mind about 76, it's at least worth a try. 